Hello, everyone. <clears throat> this new weather we have, what we call in fall, that feels like winter, man, it's taking my breath away. It's making my vocal cords do hula hoops. I'm telling you, this is some weather. Now I got to go in the closet, take out the buckets that have all the winter clothes, and try to find something that is comfortable to wear even though next week it's supposed to be back at 80 degrees again. My mother used to always tell us to dress for the season, not the weather. <laughs> now I understand exactly what she meant by that. And so these are changing times. And often we do forget those wise sayings of our mothers and fathers. And this is a time where we are being called through our Sunday school lessons to remember some things that we learned a long time ago. We are being called to address some situations that perhaps have become commonplace and normal. You can see it everywhere at all times and in all places happening and occurring. People are getting involved in things that heretofore were, were taboo. People are experimenting, going on spiritual quests and spiritual journeys. And today we're going to meet a group of people who are not believers, who are followers of God, but in a different way than believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do. These are people who are spiritual. They believe in receiving spiritual help and spiritual advice from various sources and agencies that Christians are told not to dabble with, not to engage in. So I want to read you one of those wise sayings that Moses gave to the children of Israel as we look at the background to this lesson, it is really, really uh, going to challenge us to consider how we're living today in this world. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. God gives some words in verses 10 through 14 that today you would not be uh, considered loving if you were to speak against such practices. I'm already in the lesson. I forgot to pray. Well, I didn't forget. I just, I'm so excited about this lesson. Let me go now and just pray. Father, we thank you for our time together today. Bless your word and bless us as we try to understand this word in the light of the 21st century. Bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson is simply Simon wants to buy power. Simon wants to buy power. And the problem is Simon is a sorcerer. He's one of the leaders known as a great one in his day. He can perform all types of, of astonishing things for people and in behalf of people, for entertainment, for, for help, he is regarded as somebody. We would call him a celebrity today. That's what he was in his time. And so the Bible now is going to speak to us about an old adage that God gave his people and warned them against participating in such spiritual practices. Have no doubt that these are spiritual practices. Let me read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 through 14. Moses is uh, rehearsing to the children of Israel the laws of God, the, the mores of God, the, 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 the uh, laws of God. And he says to them, when uh, verse 9, when you enter the land of the Lord, your, that the land when you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you, New Living Translation, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. Do not imitate the detestable customs 
of the nations living there. God does not say, do not engage in the good that is going on, but stay away from the detestable things. And this are some examples of what Moses said are detestable things. Verse 10, for example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Lord have mercy. <laughs> And do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. But you must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you are about to displace consult sorcerers and fortune tellers, but the Lord your God forbids you to do such things. Two key points. Number one, these spiritual practices are historically some of the most favorite of nations around the world. And secondly, God identifies, recognizes that they are practiced. God does not say, oh, that's foolishness. I uh, don't believe in that stuff. Uh, it can't hurt you. No, God says, stay away from it through the lips of Moses. He says, don't get your palm read. Don't have astrologers planning your life. Don't use any other spiritual weapons other than those that are supported, promoted, and outlined in God's word for a believer in the God of the Bible. And so God says they got their way. I have my way. I want you to live your life the way that I am commanding you, and it is for your good. Well, Simon is a sorcerer. Simon is doing marvels before the people. And now here comes the apostles. Here comes the evangelists. Here comes the men of God into this city and they encounter this man named Simon. This man named Simon, what are our aims for change as we look at this text today? As we look at this lesson, Simon wants to buy power. Well, first of all, we are going to discuss Simon's motivation to receive the Holy Spirit. What is your motive for receiving the Holy Spirit? It, there's merit in examining yourself and your motives. Secondly, we are going to reflect on any selfish desires for God's power. Any selfish desires for God's power. And finally, we're going to create a list of true and sincere motives for following Christ. Note that we are creating this list we're gonna be creating it based on the word of God, not based on our own feelings or what we think, because otherwise it would be just as flawed as Simon the sorcerer, okay? All right, those are our aims. That's what we're pushing for. And the first is of course, to discuss Simon's motivation. So let's meet Simon the sorcerer. Acts chapter eight verse nine through 11 says in your printed text, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is the great power of God. <laughs> and to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. 
Hmm. This is Simon. Simon is ruling the city of Samaria. Simon is, is ruling the belief or the faith of the people in Samaria. Simon is the celebrity. Simon has the power. Simon is the one that everyone comes to. And so he is somebody in his day. He is simply practicing sorcery. Think about that. When you hear our celebrities are using all different types of spiritual practices for their power, are you tempted to go to an astrologer? Are you tempted to roll over out of bed in the morning and read your horoscope to determine your attitude for the day? Are you tempted to use any other spiritual practice other than that sanctioned by the word of God? If so, listen in and see just how perhaps you're being led astray by what is not power in the sense of God's power, but power that is limited by earthly means as opposed to embracing God's power, God's method of being and doing righteousness. So Simon is the sorcerer. He is practicing uh, the occult arts sort of like an alchemist or perhaps a spiritualist such as Aleister Crowley and others practicing rituals, the arts that are unsanctioned by God and his word, things that God calls detestable and God says, stay away from them for they will corrupt your spirituality and corrupt your faith. Simon is getting the glory for what he's doing. But you and I know God says he will not give his glory to another. So that is Simon. That's what Simon's up to. And then comes Philip who was one of the deacons ordained by the apostles. He comes being led of the Holy Spirit to Samaria. He is engaging with the Samaritans who are being led astray by the sorcerer, Simon. Now, let us then continue to read our printed text and we'll talk a little bit about exactly uh, what is what is about to take place, what is about to happen, okay? We're going to talk about the power of the gospel to change lives, to redirect and refocus, to get people back on the path that they should be on. God does not want you to live a spooky life encountering demons and spirits that are unholy, ungodly, who will solicit your participation in their unholiness. Listen to this. The gospel brings conversions. Your, your lesson says many turn to Christ. I am putting this in a different way, although we're saying the same thing. Many don't just turn to Christ for no reason. It is the gospel that brings conversion. That is the only thing that will bring conversion from this world's way of spirituality to God's way of being spiritual and being in right relationship with the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to the scripture, your printed text, Acts chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, 
And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. The Bible clearly says that Simon, because of the gospel, believed in Jesus, even to the point of getting baptized. <laughs> Simon became a convert, but let me say he did not become a disciple. He became a believer in Jesus. What is his motive? Why did he join the band of believers? He's, he, he, he's walking with Philip and he is looking and watching every move that Philip makes, trying to do what? Learn how Philip has the power to do what he's doing. He wants that power. He wants to be able to do what Philip is doing. Philip is what? Taking believers from, from the Simon and bringing them to faith in Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And I dare say the devil is not going to ever be happy when people are being converted through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are a preacher in your town and your church is growing and you are winning souls to Jesus Christ, expect some trouble because <laughs> you're troubling the kingdom of darkness. So you can expect the kingdom of darkness to trouble you back. It's not going to be all smooth sailing. There is going to be conflict. There's going to be opposition. Now, Simon is walking with Philip. Philip is preaching the gospel, laying hands on the sick and they're recovering, helping people live better. The joy of the Lord is all over Samaria. People are coming in droves to hear the gospel and Simon wants to see how it's being done because he wants to increase his uh, resources of people. So then he's checking out Philip and he's trying to figure this thing out. Even though he has been baptized, his heart is not quite right with God. But God hasn't exposed him yet. God hasn't revealed him as just a shallow saint, as we would call a baby Christian. He's just a believer. He's just been baptized. But that old nature, that old flesh is still very much alive in Simon. And I believe that's why we can see people get saved and be saved for, you know, 20, 30 years. But they never get any further than being a baby Christian. They never change any of their worldly ways or worldly pursuits. Yet they are church members. Yes, they are believers in Jesus, but they have not made Jesus their Lord. Jesus is their savior. Jesus is their Christ, but he's not yet their Lord. God is going to have to do something to reveal to them that they are not yet where they need to be in their discipleship and in their spiritual maturity. So then, let us now think about this. We're talking about Simon's motivation. We're talking about, you know, him watching Philip do everything that Philip is doing. We're watching the people be converted to Jesus Christ and their lives totally transformed. Yet Simon's life is not transformed because he is an observer. He's a believer, but he's really just checking it out. You've heard him say, try Jesus where Simon is trying Jesus per se, <laughs> that doesn't always work. It doesn't always change anybody because if the best effect and benefit of following Jesus is being totally converted, totally sold out, totally committed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's keep going because something happens. The believers receive the Holy Spirit. 
Let's read the gospel, Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Mm. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Check this. Here, everyone has believed in Jesus. God is working miracles in their lives. The apostles hear about the great work that Philip the evangelist, the deacon is doing. And they commission uh, two of the apostles to go down and lead them in receiving the Holy Spirit. And that was Peter and John, Peter and John. And so then when Peter and John showed up, what did they do? They laid hands on them that received the Holy Spirit. They laid hands on them that they should receive the Holy Spirit. All of them that had believed, save one, Simon the sorcerer. While he was watching Philip, while he was watching Peter and John, he was not trying to receive the Holy Spirit. He's still investigating how he can get hold of such power how he can keep his reputation as being a great one, how he can stay big in Samaria because he doesn't want to lose anything. He doesn't want to give up his reputation or his status. He does not want to, 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 to do any type of surrendering of who he is to follow Jesus. He wants to follow Jesus, but he wants to increase his power not God's power. And so then the scripture says to us that the other believers have no problem receiving the Holy Spirit, but Simon has a problem. Simon then, not wanting to get in line to have hands laid on him, he makes an offer to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. This is an offer for the power of the Holy Spirit, not to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, verse 18 through 24. Let's listen in. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Catch this. He don't want to be like everybody else who's receiving the Holy Ghost freely. He wants to be able to have the power. He want to lay hands on folk. He doesn't want the power. He just want to be able to lay hands on the folk. He want, I mean, he wants the power, but he doesn't want to be filled. So he makes a simple offer. If you guys got the power, let me just buy a little bit. <laughs> Simon attempts to buy the power. He doesn't want to be like everybody else and be filled and have his life changed. And so there are various motivations for receiving what God has to offer. And we should always examine ourselves. All right, now let's continue to read. Verse 20, but Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You thought you could buy what God is giving freely. You don't understand who God is, Simon, nor do your colleagues who are practicing these detestable arts, occult arts. And so then he says, he says here, Peter says in verse 21, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. He says, you can't receive because your heart's not right. Yes, you believe the gospel, but your heart has not been changed. You have not been truly converted. And now you're offering to buy the power of God. 
that only the Holy Spirit can provide. Verse 22, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray to God and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Peter says to him, I see your spirit. The Holy Spirit has given me a gift of knowledge, a gift of wisdom. And I read your motivation. You are in the gall of bitterness. Your spirit's not right. In the bond of iniquity, you're in prison by your bitterness, meaning you have become resentful because Philip has come in town and stolen your thunder. You're green with envy. You're jealous. You're mad. You're raging on the inside because you thought you had power, but now you have encountered the power of God and you're very, very upset. You are so upset until you're imprisoned by this inner iniquity of yours. You need to repent so that God might restore you. God might cleanse you. God might wipe that blot from you and transform your motivation and transform your life. Then answered Simon, verse 24, and said, pray ye, to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. That none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. What are you talking about, Simon? This is not something that's coming upon thee. This is something that's coming from within thee. <laughs> it's already in you. You need to repent so God can remove it. What are you talking about? So that none of these things come upon thee. There's none of these things that can come upon you because you're already carrying the weight. You already have the sickness, the disease. It is festering. It is, it is, it is moldy. It is, it, is, it is gangrenous. It is atrocity that you are living with. You have no peace. You have no joy. And you're asking Peter to pray that this thing doesn't come on you when it's already all the way through you, already in you. You need to be cleansed. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Repent. Don't ask uh, Peter to pray for you. You repent. Repent of your sin. Repent of this jealousy, this envy, this iniquity that's holding you captive and keeping you from enjoying the blessings of God. Your motive is not right, but you cannot hide your motives from God. Beloved, we're almost at the 30 minute mark. Most of you know I try to be finished in 30 minutes, so I'm going to have to do something a little different to end this lesson. I want to thank you for listening today. Thank you for joining with me in this lesson. And just know that God will cleanse and restore you if you ever determine that your motives are not right. And we encounter situations where our motives are revealed to us. And when they are revealed to us, we should repent, not ask somebody else to pray for us. Pray for yourself. It is a personal thing that you must engage in. It is so personal until even if I were to pray for you, if you don't want to get rid of it, it's not going anywhere. Listen to this about the motivation from Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 following. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. That's how the gospel cuts down to reveal our motivation. One word from God can totally transform your life for the, for the good or for the bad. But if you repent, it's all good because God's grace and his mercy endures forever. Verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. 
everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. Simon is accountable to God, not Philip, not Peter, not John. Simon must stand before God in his own skin for his own life. And so must you and I. Beloved, examine your motives for serving God. Try them by the spirit and word of God and resolve that when you find the flaws, when you've already got your astrology chart for the year, when you've already had your palm read and you're following it, when you, uh, like Nancy Reagan, seek an astrologer every week uh, to find out what decisions you should make and what decisions you should stay away from, you have God. What needs of sorcerers do you have? You have God. What need of spirit guides do you have? You have God. What can an astrologer tell you about your life that you cannot find in the word of God? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and perfect will of God. God wants to change your life and he wants you to walk away from what you have been accustomed to and come into a brand new way of living. Beloved, you've got to give it up. That's what this lesson is all about. You've got to give it up. You've got to walk totally committed to Jesus and that will be done through the word of God. Only done through the word of God. I trust today that you will allow this gospel to liberate you from, from uh, spiritual practices that God says through Moses are detestable. I know we're in the 21st century and everything is, is you know, everybody's approving all different types of religions, all different types of spiritual practices. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your spiritual beliefs come from the word of God come from the preaching of the gospel. Stay away from worldly ways of being spiritual and being right and follow Jesus. Simply follow Jesus. Jesus is enough. And if you commit to Jesus, your life will never be the same. Plus you save a whole lot of money because you do have to pay money for those other practices. But to follow God through his word and the spirit, you don't have to worry about nobody charging you. And when you start giving, it's going to be out of your own spirit from the right motivations of the heart. God wants you to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. He does not want you to be like everybody else. Do not fear to stand apart from the crowd. Be your own unique self. As in fact, God calls us peculiar people. Be peculiar for Jesus Christ. God bless you today. Thank you for listening. Please like my YouTube channel. Hit the notification button so that you'll know when I post these Sunday school lessons. Please share this video with others and may God's word become a rhema in your life and you'll give up this world system and this world's way of being right. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you love us. And we ask you to forgive us for uh, imitating the ways of the world. Redeem us today through your word and your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll see you next week with another powerful lesson. And I know you're going to be blessed.